This week on Waterways. Tortuga's sooty turns. And save a turtle of the Florida Keys. Sometimes it seems that science is about getting glimpses of the big picture. Fragments of the whole cloth piecing the universe together. Each study becomes a snapshot that is then related to the whole. Much of the funding for science, like fashion, is guided by what's hot. This year it might be endangered species like crocodiles. Next year it might be coral reefs. When the subject is no longer hot, the money dries up and the study ends. Many scientists believe that to really know something about the forces that shape our world, we need to study a small piece of it for a long time, even decades. By studying an animal or plant in the place where it lives, we can learn valuable lessons about the way the world works. Seventy miles west of Key West, scientists have found an ideal animal and an ideal place to study. The sooty terns that nest on Bush Key in the Dry Tortugas. Scientists estimate that around 50 million of these seabirds live in tropical oceans around the world. Every year between 20,000 and 190,000 terns nest on a 14-acre island next to Fort Jefferson. More than 40 years ago, Dr. Bill Robertson, one of the National Park Service's first professional scientists, started studying the terns. Dr. Bill, though gentle and unassuming, was a man with a vision. Well, Bill Robertson started it under the auspices of the Park Service, and Bill worked for the park. I mean, Bill, Bill was involved in the park from shortly after the park was established in 1947. Bill came here in 1949, and then in 1950 as a graduate student, did his graduate work at Everglades, and was a Park Service employee up until 19... Uh, 97. Bill had 46 years as a Park Service employee, so Bill believed in long-term studies and Bill was a long-term study in himself. Bill and his wife Betty, also an accomplished biologist, studied the birds for more than four decades. When agency money ran out, they pulled money from their own pockets to continue the work. They thought the work was critically important. It was a funded project up until about 1980 and then for whatever reasons, uh, budgetary constraints, whatever, the project was um, brought to a, quote, official funded end. In other words, the government no longer funded it. But Bill and Betty knew the importance of this and realized it, whether the agency did or not, that there was a lot to be gained by this and that the, the agency could, could benefit by it. And they funded this out of their own pocket for the next 20 years. What Bill and Betty were able to accomplish is amazing. Together with their work crews, they banded over a half million sooty terns between the late 1950s and the 1990s. In one visit to the fort in the 1950s, Dr. Bill counted more than 180,000 nesting pairs. That's more than 360,000 birds. Betty died in 1999. Bill followed her a year later in 2000. Since their passing, Sonny Bass, Bill's hand-picked successor, has continued the work that Bill and Betty began. In late April, Sonny and his crew are out at the Tortugas, working with birds that started arriving at the end of last year. They'll first come over the island and they don't land. They just kind of check the island out and they do it in little small groups. And uh, of late, this has started like in December, that this is, is uh, started happening and then they kind of am amass and you'll hear more of them at night and you'll hear them over the island and then um, one day is what we call uh, the landing and what happens is that day a, a, a sizable group of these birds will just set down on the island and within a few days they will start having they will start laying eggs the terns seem to like open areas where there are a few short shrubs to protect their young from predators like gulls the shrubby areas of Bush Key are packed with birds. Nearby areas without shrubs are empty. 
a lot of different vegetation types here. What the turns like uh, is this 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 open area like this. They're not like common turns in that they they're a beach nester. They don't nest on beaches where there's just nothing. Not here. What they do is they like a little bit of vegetation. So what what uh, what you get are these little bare ground pieces, uh, open area with with a little bit of vegetation near it. That's what they like. One of the first things Sonny and his team do is mark and measure young birds. The weight of a bird tells scientists whether it's been a good or a bad year. If the birds show up skinny, Sonny knows they've had a hard time finding food. Once we get the chicks marked, then the real fun <laughs> begins, so to speak. It, it, it really is. It's, it's just it's, it's sitting and watching, and you have to do this hours on end. So what we're going to do on this, you know, we, we kind of situate ourselves around the perimeter. We can see the chicks on the plot. We try to see most of the chicks. We identify who's out there. So in other words, we'll take notes on which chicks we're seeing. And then we're literally sitting and waiting for the adults to come back in to feed the chicks. And so we have a, we have a chick that's marked so we know who it is. We have an adult that's marked. Um, so. If we, if we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to pair those two up. We're trying to see what adult feeds what chick. Watching individual birds requires patience and a sharp eye. But the rewards to science are many. By watching how often chicks are being fed, scientists can make some guesses about how far the parents are going to find food. If the parents feed the chicks less often, it means they're going farther and farther to find the herring and pilchards they scoop from the sea's surface. Their longer flights could mean a change in currents or sea temperatures, or both. During the last decade, terns have been arriving earlier and earlier each year. This may be another piece of evidence for the effects of global climate change. Being able to figure out how the birds are affected by climate requires more than a few years of data. This is where the length of the city turn study really pays off. If you're going to study a, anything, and you're going to use this as a, a, uh, an indicator of the health of the, the resource that you're given the responsibility to, to protect, it's important that you have a long-term study to do that. That's really the only way you can do it. I'll give you an, an example. These birds live 30 years. If you only studied them for five years, you would have no concept of what these birds do. None. You know, there's been a lot of talk about global warming, changes in the ocean and productivity. These seabirds may be a very good indicator of that. So that's one of the things we want to check. Fernando Calcera, a graduate student from Duke University, is using the data collected by Bill, Betty, and Sonny to try to answer questions about changes in climate sea surface temperature and currents. It's very hard to, to find such long-term data sets basically because they tend to be very expensive to collect or because eventually um, there's, there's thought to be a lack of interest. It's very hard to convince not only the public but, but also to convince uh, funding agencies and, 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 and so forth that to be able to, to really know what's going on uh, in terms of, of community ecology and, and, and relationship with environmental variables, uh, you need to have long data sets. Um, there's not too many. Um, uh, population uh, ecology is based on knowing what's happening from one year to the other. And if you just can, can encompass seven years or five years, it's definitely not enough. The long-term work on the turns is not only useful for looking at climate change, it's also given scientists important information about how different parts of the world are connected. For example, birds that Bill and Betty Robertson banded in the Tortugas were later found off the west coast of Africa. Because of Bill and Betty's bands, scientists came to understand that these birds spend their first few years of life in tropical African waters. Thus, the success of turns that return to the Tortugas may be influenced by conditions in the eastern Atlantic. But long-term studies also allow scientists to understand important nuances in the lives of the subjects studied. This was the case when Sonny and his team identified birds that were banded as babies over 30 years ago. 
This is much longer than many other species of terns. These fist-sized birds, which travel more in a year than a New York taxi driver, were extremely long-lived. We know that, that these birds, on average, do not return to this colony until they're about five years old. What that means is when these young birds leave, they're on the wing and in open ocean for upwards of five years at a time. To keep long-term studies like this going requires persistence. It also requires conducting operations on a shoestring. Bill and Betty Robertson used dedicated volunteers. People who believed their work with the terns was making a difference. Sonny Bass does the same. Like the terns, who sometimes travel hundreds or thousands of miles to the Tortugas to breed, some members of the team travel from other countries or states to do their work with the terns. This island is not near any international airport or luxury resort. There is no hojos on the horizon. It is hot, it is early mornings, and it is counting thousands of birds a day. But they understand why they have to keep coming back. It is their commitment that will keep the study going. I moved out to the Dry Tortugas in 1994 as an employee and Dr. Bill and Betty Robertson invited me to sit down on their research over at Bush Key. And I was so fascinated that in 1990, 1999 when I moved off the island, I left here but I couldn't leave the city. To work with Sonny Bass who worked too with, with Dr. Bill Robertson and, and, and Betty Robertson who were amazing, amazing people with, with an amazing vision. And, and that's one of the things that, that you may not learn in school. You, you, you need to go to the field and learn it. It's long-term studies. It's trying to, to see the whole picture, not, not just seeing what's happening in, in, in this very small spot where the birds are. I'll continue to work on this thing until I can't walk out here anymore. But I think long term, to me it's important that this thing continue. Um, I think, you know, it's unique in the sense of its longevity. I think the more we work on it, the more we know about it, the more we can understand the processes that are taking place around here, the better off uh, we are. Without a doubt, I think the better off management is. In the end, their work is about connecting people with the same sights and sounds the first Spanish explorer saw almost 500 years ago. For the general public, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a resource that they can enjoy. I mean, there's nothing like now watching the visitors at the, the barrier, and of course the island's closed during breeding as it should be because you don't want to disturb the birds, but having visitors, whether they're birders or just the the guy that's come down from New York City had never seen anything like this in his life. And the family's there and they look out across this thing and they see all these birds probably the exact same way it was when Ponce de Leon came here. And they can think about that. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's nice to know that there are areas like this, you know, that, that still exist. In the United States, there is nowhere quite like the Florida Keys. Recognizing the fragile beauty of this national treasure, federal and state governments have created agencies to study, manage, and preserve this resource. Ultimately, it is the citizens who call for these agencies, and it is their taxes that fund them. However, there is a limit to the money allocated for resource management. That is why nonprofit organizations emerge in imperiled environments. With support from federal and state agencies, conservation groups can be an important factor in filling gaps remaining in environmental preservation efforts. Save a Turtle was founded in 1985 by a group of concerned citizens. They wanted to do more for turtles in the Keys. And it was founded with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and at the time, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and St. James the Fisherman Church provided some insurance coverage for us. 
Save a Turtle is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit organization whose goals are to protect marine turtles and enhance their habitat in the Florida Keys and around the world. The activities and efforts undertaken by the group would not happen without them. Well, the organization got founded back in 1985 as an outgrowth of uh, myself and a Game and Freshwater Fish Commission officer at that time who identified that we actually did have a nesting population down here in the Keys and a need to get a better handle on what actually was happening. So as an outgrowth of that, our meeting and working together, uh, Save a Turtle was born. It's an organization that now covers the entire Florida Keys. We're recognized by Monroe County as the official survey and stranding network for Monroe County. Save a Turtle has a total of about 150 members, 75 of whom volunteer daily walking the Keys beaches looking for new nests. When a nest is located, the team monitors the nest productivity and protects the nest from disturbance. Sea turtle nesting season typically lasts from mid-April until the end of October. The most visible activity that our volunteers perform is walking all the turtle nesting beaches here in the Keys. And uh, they're out every morning for about six months and they're looking for signs of turtle crawls so that we can document uh, what species of turtles are nesting, in what numbers, and then after the nests have hatched, they dig up those nests, they determine how many eggs were laid, how many turtles actually made it to the water, and all of that information goes to uh, FMRI, Florida Marine Research Institute. It's compiled and put into a database that's available worldwide so that they can develop regulations to help turtles and to uh, look at their population dynamics and see where they need help. Volunteers for Save a Turtle walk the city, county, and private beaches. The state parks, such as Bay of Honda, where we are now, and Long Key are walked by rangers. And the federal lands are generally covered by U.S. Fish and Wildlife biologists. We work on approximately I'd say about 27 different beaches throughout the Keys. We don't work in state parks, national parks, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Reserves, so we focus on the areas outside of those, quote, protected areas. What we're looking for when we're walking is an area where the sea turtle has emerged from the sea, come up, since we have such small beaches here, they generally don't nest in the sandy area. They'll nest in the vegetation such as the sea oats. So we're looking for an area of disturbance where it's been dug out. One of the largest problems that sea turtles face in the Keys is new human development on beaches where turtles nest. Waterfront properties are cherished and many houses are quite close to the beach. This translates to increased human use of the beach and resulting obstructions like small sailboats or beach chairs. Nest disturbance from dogs has also typically followed increases in local human populations. We also have to think about the fact that sometimes when the turtles left the beaches as tiny babies and were at sea for 30 years or more before they became sexually mature and came back, there's been incredible changes in the Keys. They might come back and there's a house, lights, dogs, people on the beach that when they left was a pristine, beautiful area. In an amazing feat of nature, some sea turtles return to the same area where they were born 30 years later. After traveling thousands of miles, the turtle's internal GPS sometimes brings them to within feet of the source beach. Some scientists have speculated that this is due to a turtle's sensitivity to light. This theory is bolstered by the way sea turtle hatchlings use light. Whether emerging by moonlight or by sunlight, the hatchlings zero in on the reflecting brightness of the ocean to find their way to the water. Hatchling turtles disorient because they are extremely sensitive to light sources. They evolved years ago to head toward the brightest source in their environment, and that was always the ocean horizon, just from reflected moonlight, star glitter. But now our houses on the beach have security lighting, we have street lights that are quite bright compared to the ocean. 
So it creates an artificial horizon for them and they head toward the brightest light source. With over 150 million years of evolution, the turtles adapted many survival mechanisms. Unfortunately, mankind, through technology, has advanced at a much faster rate. They are aquatic animals. Their eyes are designed for use in the aquatic environment, and they're very sensitive to certain wavelengths of light that are useful to them underwater. That makes them especially sensitive to our regular light bulbs, which have all wavelengths and spectrums in them. Available at most hardware stores, low-pressure sodium lighting is a hatchling-friendly type of light for those homes and condos on nesting beaches. Many local municipalities like Marathon have switched street lamps to the low sodium bulbs. Homeowners can also close their drapes. Um, it is quite easy for interior lighting and lamp lighting, even the light of a television, to disorient a hatchling. In a typical year, Keys beaches may see up to 150 nests. Compared to the mainland, which can see that many on one beach in one night, the Keys nests are sometimes scattered on remote rocky shores. The efforts of these volunteers are a testament to the understanding they have for the big picture and the uncertain future of these turtles. It's estimated that only one in a thousand to as high as one in 10,000 hatchlings survive to reproduce. So the odds are stacked against them, and your one light can make a difference. While 75 of the 150 members in Save a Turtle have been walking beaches, 30 of these 150 are qualified for Save a Turtle's other main purpose, responding to sea turtle strandings and participating in rescue operations. If you're interested in volunteering, we do hold training sessions in March of each year and you must attend one of these training sessions in order to get your name on a permit to walk a beach. Whatever involvement local citizens commit to conservation groups irrefutably contributes to the possibility that humans can mitigate past damage and increases the possibility that a balance can be struck between human development and the natural world. Sea turtles are quite primitive creatures. They've been around in their current form for about 150 million years. So they evolved before humans were on the scene, and they can't cope with our aggressive behavior. We're taking over their nesting beaches. We're literally covering up the sand that they can nest on. We put up bright lights so we can enjoy the beach at night, and all of those activities are, are not compatible with, with their method of, of nesting and reproducing. The message of Save a Turtle is one of hope and one of warning. Their hope is that people will follow a few simple rules, resulting in beaches where turtle nests and humans happily coexist. Their warning is that sea turtles are in trouble if this peaceful coexistence cannot be found.